Good evening, everyone. Is it possible that there is only one truth, but we're all searching for it in different ways? Is it possible that all these searches take us eventually down the same road to the question of who are we and where did we come from? Perhaps it is this internal awareness inside us that stirs us and inspires us so much when we look out at a clear night and see all the stars spilled across. Perhaps this is the common thread that connects the first humans who drew constellations on their cave walls 40,000 years ago to those who stare at the stars today through their telescopes. This primordial memory in our bodies that we are all made of star stuff. 73% of a human body's mass has elements that were once fused in the cores of massive stars at least 10 times heavier than the sun. When these stars die, they explode so powerfully that they can outshine entire galaxies. We call these explosions supernovae, and they rip apart the bellies of their host stars and scatter their ashes across the interstellar medium. It is these ashes, through countless generations of stars exploding over 12 billion years, that have come together to form your blood, your bones, and your very DNA. Imagine then, when just such a supernova went off in our neighboring galaxy, that you could see it with the naked eye. It was the closest we had seen since the invention of the telescope itself. We spotted it 32 years ago in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It was 1987. The so news of this discovery spread very quickly through telegrams and faxes and phone calls, and soon the whole world had trained its eyes on this cosmic glory called Supernova 1987A. It became so popular that it even featured on the cover of Time magazine that year. Now, quite by accident, astronomers happened to have also an image of the star that had exploded as the supernova. It was the first time we had a pre-explosion image of any star. With all this data, Supernova 1987A became and remains the most well-observed celestial event in human history. And yet, astronomers could not explain why it had even happened. Because until that time, all stars were considered to live alone just like our sun, so a single massive star was expected to puff up to a giant about 500 times the diameter of the sun before exploding. But the star that was found to have exploded as this supernova was only one-tenth of that size, a hot, compact blue star. Moreover, when Hubble Space Telescope was launched, it took an image of this supernova, one of the first ones it had taken, what it found was three rings around the site of the explosion. These were ejected by the parent star well before it had actually exploded. Now, it was quite hard to reasonably explain how a star that was born alone could evolve to this compact blue structure and eject these rings before it died. So maybe the star was not born alone. Maybe it came from the merger of two stars that went around each other at some time in their past. Recent simulations have confirmed this hypothesis. Indeed, the best way to explain all the features of the blue star of 87A is from the merging of two stars that were in a binary system to become one. The new star thus born would have been about 20 times the mass of the sun, rotated so rapidly that it ejected the rings, and finally died 20,000 years later as 87A. Now, you might think, OK, binary stars, these must be rare. Our sun certainly seems to be living alone. Well, if that's the case, you couldn't be further from the truth. This is Tarantula Nebula. It's a gas cloud located in the same galaxy where 87A had exploded. Right here, we are observing 
young, massive stars. So it's a nursery of sort for these stars. What we find is that 70% of these young stars are bound to companions that they orbit around, which means massive stars are not born alone. Now, how do we go about finding these binary star systems? Well, one of the ways we do this is to look for star eclipses, so that when one star goes in front of the other, there's a periodic change in the brightness of the system. We call these eclipsing binaries. Now, there is such a star in the constellation of Perseus. The ancients called it the demon star. The Arabs called it Al-Ghul, while the Greeks thought it was the eye of the monster Medusa because it kept winking at them quite sinisterly every few days. Turns out, Al Ghul is not one star, but a binary system, an eclipsing binary system, with an orbital period of three days, which is why it was winking sinisterly every few days at our ancients. That's it right there. That's the constellation of Perseus. The next time you look up, look out for this guy. So when binary stars interact, their dynamics are quite interesting, just like in human couples. So here, you can see the more massive star is losing its mass to its companion and becomes the less heavy one in the relationship, and then decides to drift apart and never meet its companion again. Here, you see a massive star that has lost its mass to its companion, but this time encircles it like a cosmic hug and then whirls it around its envelope. This is what we call a common envelope phase in a binary star's life. Now, if the stars are born even closer, then they can come into contact by exchanging a cosmic kiss, which could last for a few million years. We call these contact binaries. The outcome of the last two rather intimate scenarios is that the stars could emerge even closer than they were before or end up merging to form a whole new beautiful star that would explode like 87A. Massive stars lead very dramatic lives. They live very quickly through and then die explosively like supernovae. When they die, they leave behind one of two corpses, either a neutron star or the dreaded black hole. Now, a neutron star is not a star at all. It is a compact object that's held up by forces exerted by neutrons that refuse to be squished into one another. We're talking about an object that is so dense that about one and a half times the mass of the sun is squeezed into a ball of about 30 kilometers wide. That's about the size of a human city. A teaspoon of neutron star mass would weigh about 10 million tons on Earth. Black holes, probably what you've been waiting for for a while. These are the heavier, denser cousins of neutron stars. They can weigh up to 100 times the mass of the sun. A black hole that is the mass of the Earth would be only about a centimeter wide. It is this insane density that leads to the infamous gravitational tug of black holes, which is so powerful that not even light can get past it. So, when a binary star system dies, you can expect one of three combinations to be left behind a pair of neutron stars, or a black hole and a neutron star, or a pair of black holes going around each other, right? But, but wait a minute, two black holes going around each other? These are invisible, aren't they? Light doesn't get past them, so how do we go about looking for these? Well, we don't look for them, we try to hear them. That signal you heard? traveled 1.3 billion light years to get to us. It was the final seconds just before a couple of black holes rammed into each other and merged to become a single giant black hole. 
What you heard was not the actual sound of the collision itself, of course, because sound doesn't travel in vacuum, and that's what's out there. What you heard was the pattern of the gravitational waves released from that colliding event. In 1915, Albert Einstein proposed a whole new theory of gravity. In it, he asked us to imagine the entire universe as a single fabric where space and time are intertwined. When two massive, dense objects like black holes go around each other, they lose energy. And this energy is what is released as gravitational waves. These waves can actually stretch and squeeze the fabric of space and time, making space and time itself to vibrate. No other phenomenon we know can do this. Now, when these waves travel out through the universe, they keep losing energy as well. So by the time they get to the Earth, they become so weak that they can only make space-time vibrate by about a fraction of the size of a proton. So we don't really feel the impact of these massive collisions. But LIGO does. The Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory is the fruit of 20 years of labor. It is the world's most sensitive ruler, and it was built for the sole purpose of detecting these atomic-sized cosmic vibrations. There are two of these instruments located about a few thousand miles away from each other in the USA. So when a signal is detected in both of them at the same time, we can be assured that its source was cosmic. Now, when LIGO makes a detection of a signal, it is then cleaned up, and we just get the frequency pattern of the gravitational wave from that signal. From the waveform, we can then deduce what the masses of the black holes were and how fast they were rotating before they collided. It is this signal, this frequency pattern, that is then converted into an audio clip like the one you just heard, effectively allowing us to listen to the symphonies of gravitational waves. What you're going to see next is a simulation of two black holes colliding. So this is what you would have witnessed if you were in the vicinity of this event. As the black holes orbit each other, they lose energy, and this causes them to come closer. And this, in turn, causes the frequency of their gravitational waves to keep increasing until it reaches a crescendo, the whoop you heard in the signal, when the two black holes collide and merge. And after that, there's just silence. In 2015, LIGO picked up a signal just like that. Its first gravitational wave detection was made about 100 years after Einstein proposed its existence. It came from the very same black hole couple that was dancing about a billion light years away, and it was found that each of those black holes were about 30 times the mass of the Sun, so together they merged to form a huge 60 solar mass black hole. Let us hear that historic clip one more time, which won the Nobel Prize in 2017. <laughs> Since 2017, we have heard about nine more such black hole mergers and even a pair of neutron stars merging. In the meantime, over the last 32 years, our beloved supernova 1987A has continued to evolve. The shock from the event has hit the inner ring, which was ejected by the parent star, and bright spots have started to appear there wherever there is impact from the collision. This ring is expected to be completely destroyed by the year 2025. 87A is, is a supernova very close to us, not just because of its distance, because we also know its story right from its birth to its first light, and then its aftermath. It remains the best laboratory we have to study how massive stars die. Did it leave behind a neutron star or a black hole? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. But with LIGO, we no longer are restricted to what we can see in the universe. 
We can now sit back and listen to the many musical melodies of gravitational waves from colliding corpses in the darkest realms of our universe. Thus, together with light and darkness, with telescopes and gravitational wave detectors, our cosmos awaits to be explored. By the year 2022, the largest space telescope, well, the largest telescope on Earth ever to be built will be completed. It's called the LSST, and its construction is happening right now in Chile. We'll be observing about 800 supernovae per night, as against the current rate of a few tens per night. With all the information we get, we'll be able to map the origin of the elements that have created life you see around you. With JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, which will soon be launched again in a couple of years, we'll look even further back to the very first stars that our universe created and their explosions. These stars were heavy, going up to thousands of times the mass of the sun. Did they also live with companions in binary systems? JWST will also let us know about that. And finally, we come to LISA, the next generation gravitational wave detector, soon to be launched into space in a decade or so. LISA will look back beyond the first stars to the dark ages of the universe. Not only will it detect all sorts of binary mergers and supernovae, it can also be able to detect the quake of the Big Bang, which created the entire universe. What we know of the cosmos today is the result of a collective human effort over thousands of years in its search for the truth of its origin. The coming decade will see the largest such united human effort with scientists, engineers and students coming from different countries, races and genders. There could be no better time in history than now to look up at the stars and wonder what they are. Thank you very much.